I guess this is going to go on both of our channels, so we should both say hi. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, I'll let you start if you want. Okay, so for those of you who know who I am, this is D.H. Thorne. I'm here with the illustrious Enoch Petroselli, big buff, you know, left-hand path uh, magician. And uh, so, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm D.H. Thorne. I got my own channel. And go ahead, Enoch, just tell us about yourself. Say hi. Hey, guys, I'm Enoch Petroselli, uh, obviously a male witch and author of a few books, currently working on new material, and uh, have my YouTube channel, uh, Petroselli, also. Thanks for having me, DH. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. This is like we're both recording this, so this is, I'll probably I'll probably have you put yours up for a little bit first to get those views, and then we'll put it up online. So, so right. uh, so let's pretend it's mostly on your channel. But but uh, so uh, we've been sort of like tacitly chatting a little bit back and forth for the last month, and you mm -hmm. uh, like I offered, and like just the other day you were like, actually, yeah, let's do it. So you said you had some questions, and I I asked you a few things just to get to know you a little bit before we before we got on the call because I like to read people, but uh, you seem like a cool guy, and I really want to to get to know you. So let's begin with what we talked about with you, if you don't mind, just sure. a little bit. Um, and uh, the the big things was you know you told me a lot about you know you had that that we'll say crisis experience. You had an experience that kind of awakened you to. A bigger world, right? You, you kind of almost like in in uh, Doctor Strange, like the, the the priestess like hit you and you got knocked out of your soul basically, and you had this experience that that showed you there was more to life than some material delusion. So, why don't you start there a little bit? I know you probably have more questions for me intended, so you start there. Kind of tell me again what you told me, but in whatever way you want, and and we'll work that into the conversation, man. All right, sounds good. Um, let me back up on some things I didn't tell you. Um, actually, like when I was a child, I had a lot of uh, psychic experiences. And I know a lot of people say that, but you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the same with me. <laughs> I, had a lot of, um, I wanna say like paranormal experiences with um, uh, ghosts and a lot of night, I had uh, constant nightmares when I was a kid, just all the time. And I think it was, what it was, was a lot of different spirits visiting me as a child. And um, so that was kind of where it all started. But I gradually grew out of it as I grew older um, into my late teens and kind of fell asleep, if you will. And um, when I was about 21, I got in a serious car accident. I wasn't driving. A friend of mine was driving at the time. And um, when the car settled after we hit a rock wall and just barrel rolled uh, through a bunch of trees. Um, wow, what, so, so what, you're like, you caught air and like flipped over, like really? Like, yeah, wow. we're in the air. Uh, we were going like 100 miles an hour. And <laughs> oh man. Oh. Hit a rock, well, uh, what happened, I'll, I'll go into some detail. The car, um, we hit a knoll at the bottom of a hill and the car kind of bounced up in the air and when it landed, it was in the wrong lane. So the, the driver overcorrected, um, and the car just spun sideways, and the tires blew out, and we hit a rock wall on the side of the road and just went airborne into a bunch of trees and just bounced um, over and over again off the trees, off the, off the ground. And I just remember hitting the ceiling of the car over and over again, and my shoulders got messed up, mm. especially the left shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, and when the car settled, I felt blood just drizzling down my my head, and and um, but my eyes were closed, and I remember seeing outside of the vehicle, the car smoking and kind of a bird's eye view of the vehicle, and feeling an urgent need to get out of the vehicle as soon as possible. And, but that was my first um, experience as an adult, I guess I would say, of having third eye sight or out of body sight, if you want to call it that. And then from there, I kind of got into yoga and doing meditation and stuff like that. But I was still very Christian uh, at this point in my life. And I um, eventually um, had uh, some problems, I think, that were connected to my childhood and to the accident where I had a psychotic break and became grossly psychotic and committed a serious crime. And from there, I was admitted to a, a psychiatric facility and 
while I was at the psychiatric facility, that's when I got into left hand path magic mm -hmm. and really started putting the pieces of myself back together and doing a mm -hmm. lot of different uh, rituals for healing and stuff like that. So. Sure. One thing we touched on before we, we really got on was like one of the first things we brought up was like how we see, especially you see the left hand and how it's not evil necessarily. It is dark and mysterious and a lot of things that would people would like if you're a love and light right hand typer, you're going to see us as evil no matter what because of what we're willing and capable of doing. But you don't see it and neither do I as an evil path specifically. It's just no taboos maybe would be a safe way to put it. How would you describe your your interpretation of the left hand and why you think that was important for you uh weirdly i don't see it as good or evil i see it as a path that can have good or evil people in it mm -hmm. but really I, I see the right hand path as having um an evil kind of idea of um it sure seems like it it's a lot more about controlling people and enslaving yeah. people and moralism that just turns you into a slave right right and don't get me wrong i know there are good people that follow the right hand path mm -hmm. who, are, who are christians and catholics or whatever um just like there are bad people in both paths you know? yeah, but yeah yeah i just think um the the belief that you have to listen to something outside of yourself absolutely no matter what it says to have faith in it um is uh, incorrect belief and uh, that in itself can be evil and in the left hand path you don't have to listen to anything it's all advice and you your individual will matters to the extent that you can make your own decision about what spirits are telling you to do or what advice they're giving you so that's kind of my perspective about that. I, I agree pretty much you know 99 95 percent with everything you said like to the point where like we could have a beer and be like everything's perfect you know because that's that's so true. I mean, it, there is a lot of that. There is a lot of of. So I don't like to see things as good or evil at all. Like I think good and evil are just directions we look in. I think good and evil is is sort of, it's it's vanity. Like we think of, oh, the universe must know what good and evil is in an uh, objective way because we feel like there's good and evil, but really the idea of good and evil is is subjective and and personal. So, you know, like uh, in the Adams family, Morticia is famous as saying, you know, what is what is order for the spider is chaos for the fly. And and that's absolutely true. You know, what what we think of as good and evil from a human perspective isn't always really uh, a higher good, you know, at least not in that morality sense. Uh, what we do see, however, on the left hand path is this intention where. To like you said, it's it's all about what you decide it's it's self-sovereignty it's it's a very libertarian perspective it's a very freedom oriented perspective it's a very you know um tolerant perspective it's it's to see the beauty in anything because you want to be able to to access it all because you're either on the path to become a living god or to realize you are god it's it's really those two are the, are the way that the left hand works right it's either apotheosis to become so you either you exit this simulation and become a god in your own world or you recognize this is already you this whole thing is already you're doing and you start to live as a, an awakened god being either way it's the same thing you're not you're not merging with an external god you're not submitting to an external god you are that divinity right now and, and that's pretty much what all the the older mystical the, the truer i would say mystical traditions try to teach us if we look and really understand them they're all telling you that you're god um but they all sort of insert talking points about humility which the right hand path takes too far like you know we are supposed to recognize that our ego is just an illusion and not take it too seriously but that doesn't mean we're supposed to shun it or to be ashamed of it or to be subordinate to something else the ego is already as subordinate as it's, as it's going to be. So the real trick is to see our ego as a mask and not take it too seriously. Like D.H. Thorne's a character I play. You can attack this character all day long and usually you're just attacking a phantom. This guy doesn't exist. I mean, the guy that I am behind D.H. Thorne doesn't exist either. It's all just a story. And 
the real me is untouchable. It's untouchable consciousness. It's untouchable divinity. You can't, you can't stab my soul. Like you can't hurt what I really am. You can kill my body. You can kill my good name, but that's not me. If that all ends up dying or being destroyed or, or whatever, yeah, it might hurt, but I'm going to keep going as God. It's not going to stop. So there's a real freedom in that. Whereas the right hand wants you to be completely and utterly like bending the knee to what they think is good. And what they think is good always serves that pyramid scheme of the priesthood and the, and the, and the, the government on top. That's, that's what always happens. Right. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um, I, you know, uh, there's not much about what you said that I would disagree with at all. I think, um, it's all one thing. It's all one mind, and because of that, we um, we have to recognize that our ego is just a piece of that. But it's also we, uh, our spirit or our consciousness, awareness, or whatever you want to call it, is a hundred percent the whole thing, and also a whole individual. That's kind of what I usually tell people. Is that we are it's kind of like a paradox like um in advaita it's atman and brahman being the same thing That's yeah really what it is atman being the personal soul is is identical with the brahman which is the ultimate soul they're identical they're just almost like a funnel like one's a little version and one's a big version but they're the same thing so you're literally the brahman inverted on itself so so imagine like a Klein bottle or something. You're like an inverted three-dimensional object looking into yourself somehow is one way to, to describe it. So you're right. I agree with that. It's, it is paradoxical from, a, from our little insect level of understanding, but from that higher understanding, it's very clear to me. Uh, like uh, it's, it's paradoxical and hard to put into words, but you just did a really good job just then, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I steal from the best. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Uh, but it's like the the idea of the twin terminals. You know, one plays off the other. There's balance and um, the yin, yin and the yang, and and because of that interplay, there there can be power and there can be um, advancement. You know, because of that. Um, friction yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's self friction though isn't it that's the interesting it is. thing yeah. is it's like you know if you're the yang then the other side looks like yin and if you're the yin the other side looks like yang but they're really doing the same thing they're all going in the same direction so one if you're the yang you feel like the yin is pulling you and if you're the yin you feel like the yang is pushing you Right. So they're but they're both a push and a pull together that they so so like the way I described it is they're not actually swirling around like instead of visualizing them as two fish chasing each other, see them instead as becoming each other, that they're literally fading into becoming each other as they go around. It's not it's it's actually way more 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 beautiful than just some spinning wheel. It is they're literally the same energy in a in a cyclic spin and, and they're all going the same direction. But they feel like they're conflicted, like they feel like if you look at a yin yang and where that little center line is, they, they feel like there's friction there, like they're rubbing against each other, but they're not. They're really all going the same direction. And that's a very important thing to realize in your life is like no matter how much friction you feel, you know, like, uh, oh, things just aren't working out. I can't get the loan I want. I can't get the job I want. I can't get the whatever I want, my girlfriend, whatever. That friction feels like you're being denied, but really that's part of the flow towards something bigger, towards something much more divine that you're doing. It, like it's you're not a victim of it. You 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 think you're a victim because you think you're this little teeny thing, but you're all of this, right? So, yeah. you know, if you think you're a ball, then you think a bat is an enemy. But if you but if you're the whole game, that that's supposed to happen. It's meant to be getting banged around back and forth. It's supposed to be doing that. Yeah, um, and that's that kind of brings me to the idea of um, the dark night of the soul, I'm feeling very depressed for maybe years at a time. Um, think about the feeling of happiness that you get when that ends and things kind of uh, fall into place for you after years of hard work and suffering towards a goal. Um, achieving that goal and having that state of happiness 
is much better because you suffered to get there. I love that you said that. I love this because it's, it is literally, we need to have the pain to feel the pleasure. Like we shouldn't look at pain or suffering as a negative, you know, like that's my problem even with Zen. And I like quoting Zen stuff. My problem with Zen would be this, this attachment to the idea of ending your suffering. Like everyone joins, I'm sure at the highest levels, when you talk to a real, you know, Roshi, that's like really a master, they laugh at the whole idea because they don't, they, they probably would agree with me. But when, when you see the, the, the external imagery of Zen, why people join Buddhism, Zen, all of these things, it's because they're chasing a relief from suffering. Mm -hmm. And the only way to really have that relief is to recognize it's inevitable. It's the only way is, is to embrace it, to lean into it, you know, in a sort of stoic way, maybe not, not, a, not a, certainly not a nihilistic way, but definitely in a little bit of a, of a, of a stoic kind of way and say, this suffering, this dark night of the soul is why I can have the glory of pleasure. That's why I can have those, that moment of fulfillment without that dark, like you said, without that dark night of the soul to really crush that ego and really make you feel like you're nothing. You know, to make you feel like you can't do anything, then when you climb that mountain, is it as sweet as it would be if you never had that dark night of the soul? Would it just be a hill if you didn't hit the lowest low? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, all right, cool, man. So, so you had some some questions for me, but I I'm, I think I'll think up some more questions for you as we go along. But your current practices that you were describing were mostly. You said built around, I think you said Kabbalistic stuff, the Cliff Off, uh, Cliff Off, however you want to say it, and and all of that. Would you describe a little bit of that for me? Because that's something I don't know much about. Like to me, I'm very much an outsider looking in on that system of magic. Okay, where to start? Um, yeah, exactly. Right. That's it. You know, <laughs> it's basically planetary magic, to be honest. It's basically um, connecting with the planetary energies and connecting with the tree of Doth, in which uh, the different spheres on the tree of death, um, which is the inverse of the tree of life, obviously, um, you you kind of connect with the uh, energies of the different planets and those different spheres and also the tunnels of set or the building, the bridges in between those um, different spheres. And you initiate through each one. And when you want to do magic, you kind of choose which energy you need for a specific spell. And you can kind of, after you initiate through the specific um, sphere or tunnel of set, you can harness that energy more uh, safely and easily once you're attuned to it and you've passed the initiations. And um, so that's it in a nutshell, but there's obviously a lot more to it. You know, there's a lot of um, different rituals and different spheres that you can access that aren't really on the tree. You know, there's like hidden realms and hidden um, hidden like portals, I guess I would say, and different veils that you can access as you climb the tree. So, would you say that? So, because now me being like, I don't know how I'd say this. Sometimes I say like really rational, but I'm whatever I am. I'm anti superstitious, anti literal mythology. In other words, I love mythology, but I don't believe in taking anything too literally. Would you agree that that the Sephiroth and the Cliffon are? Or Sephiroth, I don't know how you prefer to pronounce it, are are more symbolically real than they are. So they're not literally worlds. We're, we're talking about planetary energies as represented by the ancients, of course, with the seven original planets, and then of course the other hidden realms and stuff. But these are these are psychological, spiritual, mm. you know, not too literal, right? Or would you say that there's something more literal going on? Would you say that there's really planes of reality that are literal, or are they um, more like mental, mental? You know, here's the problem with trying to figure out if they're literal or not. Um, nothing is literal. Ooh, I love you already. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. you. Know, Good. It's all. <laughs> that's the thing that I'm kind of running into a lot, especially as I become more advanced with the this type of magic. Is it's all mind, you know. Right. Um, Even you and I aren't literal. We're just ideas. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's all mind, and when you see like a spirit and they manifest in a physical form. Um, but you're seeing them through the veil, it doesn't mean that they're not as real as you are, you know, and you're not that yes. real. Yeah. So it's like, we're both not real. Like, like yeah. Zeus and I are equally unreal. It's just, I'm identified with the body right now, but he's identified with an idol on my altar. Like, what's the difference? Like right. we're both stories, right? That's, that's kind of what it comes down to. Yeah. And, uh, that's kind of, 
another thing that I'd like to bring up is when I do some of these initiations that I'm that I've been doing lately, I I would love I will literally hear a narrator start talking about me and like start narrating my life. And it's, it's is it weird. Morgan Freeman? I hope. Please say it's Morgan Freeman. I'm kidding. I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually uh, a, a gray alien that does it okay. for yeah. that particular race. But um, and the reason is, I think of gray aliens as kind of archetypes, uh, not archetypes, architects of the reality that we're in, that we are in. They're kind of like, what would happen if this this story took place and this soul incarnated here and this soul incarnated here. Let's run that uh, reality and see what happens. Oh, just interesting. Just yeah. Experiment yeah. and see um, what unfolds and what yeah, feelings. Yeah, because I'm in a weird place on aliens. Like I, I'm, I'm open to it. I'm definitely into the science and I understand all that stuff. But there's a part of me that says, as much as I believe that there's life in the universe, I kind of doubt that it's flying here just to like take our water and screw ourselves in the butt. It's right? not flying here. Um, right. It's it's here. It's all here. Mm -hmm. They're not flying. They're just here. They're just here. And and, and yeah. we see them probably as gray aliens for some reason that's more um, symbolic than an actual like they're not actually like you can disagree, of course, like yeah. they're not actually like little gray alien men. That's just what our conscious says that that's what the kind of like. Um, uh, any kind of optical illusion, your brain will jump to whatever conclusion is the most symbolically rational for what you're seeing. So uh, some people would actually say that the greys are the fae, and the fae are not little winged fairies. They're, they're something way more intense than, than any of that cutesy stuff. They're way more intense. Uh, I, like, I like Damien Eccles' conversation about the fae. He had a really good video about that. And so, you know, what, tell me more about that. What do you think of what I said, or do you disagree, agree? Like, sh fill in the blanks for me. Um, yeah, I would have to disagree to an extent, um, but only to an extent, because okay. um, they are liter literally aliens in that they exist on other planets, mm -hmm. and they have physical existence, you know? Um, but uh, at the same time, they're all... Um, there's only one race, there's only one kind of mind, and that's what we are. Mm -hmm. They just have a different um, shell. I see. So so they're like maybe communing with us like in an astral way, is what you're thinking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, so it's not spaceships. It's it's The spaceships are like mental portals for them to see us, maybe. It's spaceships. They have astral spaceships. They have physical spaceships. But remember when I said it was all mind? Mm -hmm. um, their spaceships can phase into our physical reality if they wanted them to. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted you to see them, they can do that, yes. But they're also, they also can phase into etheric realities and the etheric planes. And that's usually where they stay. They don't often, unless they want to be seen, they don't often become physical. So all this stuff about being abducted and getting anal probe, that's obviously just, just nonsense that, that people misinterpret maybe um, or, or what would you say a lot of abductions are etheric in that mm -hmm. you are taken from your body in a way but not literally taken physically i see okay a lot of but not all of them there i think there are some real like um, physically experienced um or experienced on this particular plane abductions that that happen and there are good i there i go again using good and evil that's but fair, <laughs> at least from our position. <laughs> benevolent and uh, m malevolent, malevolent. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Ones that will harm you, or there are ones that will also help you. You know, there's good and evil. For the sake of this conversation, I'm going to say good and evil. From the there's human good. perspective, there's there's yeah. what, what a human would say is good and evil, right? There's good and evil alien greys, zetas. There's good and evil people. There's good and evil demons, from a human perspective. So, yeah, there's certainly ones that you like as much. Like one of the things I did a video about not too long ago, because uh, I found myself getting into the trap of acting like demons are always good guys, and you know, yeah. because after a while you kind of you realize that good and evil are nonsense, and so you stop looking at things through that silly you know binary. 
And so you start to see the good in everything. Just like like if I see a spider going across my table, I go, ew, a spider. I go, oh, come here, cutie. You know, and in the same way, I look at a demon, even one that will eat my babies, so to speak, you know, in the most horrible way. I go, yeah, but they're still potentially friendly. I can still talk to them, right? Just like, you know, when I live in a bad neighborhood growing up, I would talk to the gangbangers just like I talked to everybody else. And I wasn't really scared, even though maybe I should have been. I wasn't, you know, maybe I'm stupid like that. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I would say that, I, I fell into the trap for a little while on my channel of only talking about the good and not really talking about what's potentially dangerous about it because maybe they're only safe for certain people, but some people are too easily twisted by their own desires and egos and nonsense. And to those people, a demon is a monster because the, because those demons will feed on that side of them just like any shadow would. Right. So maybe, you know, maybe that's what it is. Maybe I should be pushing that angle a little bit further because it's almost like I'm bragging like, Oh, they're all good to me. Maybe, maybe I'm subconsciously bragging in a way. Maybe, um, maybe it's an unhealthy thing. Let me go in on what you just said about, um, the, uh, demon being bad for specific people. Like a specific person might have, uh, mental, mental imbalances, mm -hmm. weaknesses in their mind that can be exploited when a demon kind of tests them and tests the waters, see what they're made of, they might be like, oh, you're, you're, um, they might give them grandiose ideas, for example, and say that they're all this and that they're perfect and they're invincible. And a person would believe that, but they're actually just fucking with them. But because right. they have the weakness of being gullible, then it, then it, you know, it's dangerous for them to, um, work with that particular entity. That's exactly my experience with shadow people to the point where there are times when I often question, should I even consider them separate from what others would call demons back in the ancient times? Mm -hmm. Are they really separate? And, and I see them as separate for now uh, because human, human beings, we are capable, since we're all divinity incarnate, we're capable of creating, in a way, any perceivable reality we want to perceive. That, that doesn't mean we literally create, create, but we are able to... to Focus, by focusing our attention, we kind of create the experience that we have. And if we focus on our shadow as a shadow person rather than a demon, then it's going to manifest even visibly as a shadow rather than some horned, you know, cloven hoof, hoof monster. Like that, that's the old way of seeing your inner darker shadow, like Jung would call it. Whereas shadow people would be like a newer urban myth version of that. And it still works. It's got the same energy to it in a lot of ways. Maybe, maybe exactly the same in a lot of ways. Um, I still feel like there's a separateness, not separate in the, because there is no separation, but there is a distinction. There's definitely a, dif a yeah. difference. But I feel like, like you can work with either one to the same end. You can work with demons with the same intention as shadow people, right? So absolutely, I find that, that really important, you know, what you're saying there. So, yeah. Um, speaking of shadow stuff, um, would you say that there is a particular shadow realm or a particular shadow uh, a dimension? So perceptually speaking, there's as many dimensions and realms as your consciousness wants to focus and hone in on. In other words, in my cosmology, as a non-dual left-hand uh, type of person, non-dual in the general broad sense, I don't I don't follow Advaita specifically as a religion. I don't believe in all the morality of it, but the 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 ontology of it. I agree enough with that I could identify, you know, that Neoplatonism to me are very, very similarly accurate. Um, so from that, from that perspective, well, I'm also merging my rational scientific understanding of reality. The right. way I see it is if, if you're someone who doesn't get the mystical side, but you're more scientifically minded, imagine if you will, the concept of a block time universe a block time universe is a multiverse in which anything that is possible already exists. Time is sort of an illusion. We're actually consciousness moving through a greater reality. In other words, reality is not moving. Uh, this cup isn't moving in my hand. That's not happening. This, it's actually here and here and it's static. But our conscious is like a needle on a record where all the data is on the record. The needle's moving. So our conscious is what's moving through reality and we're moving through a timeline that is rational to the timeline we're already finding ourselves. So it's really difficult, for example, for me to suddenly be able to fly up in the air because that's not rational for me. It doesn't, it doesn't work in my accepted dream, if you will. So right. that would be too unreal. It'd be too far out. And if I started doing that, I might, I might have a breakdown. It might not work for me. 
But maybe, maybe somewhere in the multiverse of possibility, that ability exists. If I could twist and contort my consciousness right, I might be able to land there. Now, that means that anything that is conceptually possible exists. Now, when I say conceptually, I don't mean just within human conception. I mean in the divine conception. Anything mm -hmm. that the divine can conceive of likely exists somehow. And it is possible to tap into that. So from that perspective, even if it's only a collective conscious dream that is the shadow dimension, shall we say, I like to call right. it the abyss. You know, I call it the abyss. It's 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 utter darkness. It's this probably similar to the pit that would be in where you got your namesake Enoch, the book of the book of Enoch, the pit where the the the, the watchers were cast into. It's probably that same pit of of the abyss, the utter pure darkness of no light, of no awareness. And this is what was the key to understanding their relationship to the Jungian shadow, because what is your Jungian shadow other than parts of what you are, basically your watcher? parts of your watcher, which you are ignoring and hiding from yourself. So let's say, for example, you have, I don't know, name some evil that, that, that you, that you're ashamed of about. Maybe, maybe you're a, a rapist, maybe you're a murderer, maybe you steal, or maybe you just talk shit about your friends and aren't, aren't really proud of that. So you hide it and you kind of deny it about yourself. Like you don't integrate it. You don't realize like an alcoholic, oh, I've got a problem and I've got to work on it. You literally go, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't got a problem. I'm not a, I'm not a, a rapist or a murderer. I had to do that for a reason. So you bottle up and hide all of that literally in the abyss. You cast it off into the abyss and it festers there. It grows there because when you're not integrating it, that doesn't really separate it. All that really does, it kind of empowers it because now you, you don't even know it's working in your life. You still act on it but you act on it subtly. You don't do it in an integrated way. So for example, someone, I don't know, picks up Mohanus, like a pedophile, right? Not that yeah. I'm giving them any kind of, uh, you know, license, but say somebody like a pedophile who knows they've got this issue. Um, if they deny it, then they're going to sit there salivating over pedophilia type of things, being really interested in it and always ideating like, Ooh, I should, I want to do that. Ooh, but I can't, but I can't, you know, and they're going to hide it. Whereas somebody who, says, you know what, I do have this problem and I've got to learn to somehow integrate it so I don't act on it and be controlled by it. And and maybe it will have less power over my actions and my mind if I do that. And you can apply that to anything. I say only pedophilia because it's like the most heinous thing that comes to mind. Like that's the, whenever I think of like the most disgusting thing I can think of, that's it. So like something like that, people have a tendency to hide from themselves where it kind of, eats them in the dark, right? It kind of becomes like something that chews them up from the inside and they don't, they don't, they become sick and they become unwhole because of it. And that is where the shadows breathe. That's where shadow people, when, when you don't integrate them, but you're still empowering them, shall we say, you know, that's when they can potentially become visible literally to people who are sensitive to them. And, and like you said, seeing through the veil, if you will, can literally be seen that way. Um, so, uh, but again, that could be called a demon. If you go back 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, the difference between a shadow and a demon is like, you know, they would say you're splitting, you're splitting, it's like six of one, half a dozen of the other, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, kind of like the idea of demons being uh, ancient pagan gods. That know, too, yeah. yeah. Gods of light, and now they're kind of called demons. Yeah, I got a lot to say on that because that to me is, the Christian shadow. So they took, I, I agree with you completely. Every one of the demons, not everyone, but probably everyone was what? once a, a, a God that people loved that yeah. was demonized by some culture that replaced it. Probably even the demons of like, you know, if you go to Samaria and the, 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 the ones you're supposed to be cared, scared of, like the one you're wearing, the Litu, Lilith, the one oh, you're yeah. supposed to be scared of was probably a good guy to some ancient culture that they, conquered or fought against and and it was their matron mother right that's probably what it was so probably every demon was probably a good guy somewhere in human history probably right you know? that makes sense yeah so now lilith do you do you do you work specifically with lilith as as a favored or is that just one you're wearing for today as a blessing like what's your deal with that I kind of uh have a uh affinity towards her I, I devote more time to her than um, a lot of others because 
I don't know, I'm just drawn to her. I just go with my gut with these things. I kind of, if I like a demon or, or a goddess or god, I just will go with that feeling and work with them a lot more. And another one would be like Lucifer, for example. He's been really good to me throughout throughout my 30s, I guess I would say, mm -hmm. I, uh, over, the, over the years. And, you know, um, Lilith is just another one where to me, she's the good representation of the divine feminine or demonic feminine. You know, as I've learned who they are, when possible, as I learn who they are outside of the Christian Abrahamic side, I always end up finding myself being drawn more to their original incarnation. So Lilith, I'm more interested in, in Lilithu. In, in Beleth, I've learned that's Belet, meaning the, the feminine version of Baal. It's, it's, it means lady in ancient Akkadian. So Beleth is really a female entity. That's why a lot of people see Beleth as a feminine kind of king, right? He comes through like kind of effeminate to a lot of people. Like wonder why, like maybe that's why. Um, could be, you know, maybe subconsciously in the, 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 there's still that remnant of femininity in there. Um, and a lot of the, the gods and goddesses that become demons are like that. They're like, invert, like, so a lot of people would say Lucifer is Venus, although I kind of like Poseidon uh, Neptune as well for different mm -hmm. reasons. Like I think that maybe in Sumerian, he might have been Enki, right? But then as time went forward and, and the, the, the planetary energies were perceptively changed by the cultures, it became more of Venus because the original incarnation of Venus was a goddess of war and reflection. The, the, the mirror wasn't vanity. You know, the symbol of the mirror that's associated with Venus wasn't vanity. It was actually reflection in in a very deep way like like the good kind of reflection like like real you know shadow work you know recognizing things about yourself it was really powerful once upon a time so that venus angle works so kind of since lucifer is a is a modern egregore created by superstitious christians from the middle ages and the dark ages out of a mistranslation from the bible based on a satanic adversarial entity since it's, it's sort of a compound egregore that's got all these different things in it, so you could probably, in my opinion, safely say Lucifer is both a fallen angel, it's also Loki, it's also Venus, it's also Neptune. You could probably do all of that safely, yeah. like I think. Yeah. Um, yes, but at the same time, they, they are an individual in a lot of ways. Like Lucifer is an individual entity that has a particular energy signature. You know, but he's also made up of different parts of mm -hmm. maybe different entities of the past. Because mm -hmm. like, an uh, egregore is an egregore, right? Like once it's there, yeah, it's yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, hmm. Lucifer once even said to me when I was inquiring about that, like, who are you really? He kind of gave me what I call a psychic slap when I was meditating on it. And I felt like his jolt and like just like, oh, like, like totally drained for a second. And I heard the voice say, stop trying to make us all the same. We appear to you mortals as different things for a reason. We appear to you as Lucifer or whatever, because that is the face that you need to see at that time. But really, we're all the same source, so your inquisition will end up at the same answer in the end always, which defeats the purpose, right? So if, if I follow Lucifer all the way back to its origin, I'm eventually going to get to my own origin, which is the same divinity that we all are, right? Yep, there's your answer. I mean, you could say they're all connected, and they are, you know. Yeah. I mean, they're all connected. So, but I like to honor the uh, individual masks and give them, like even Astareth and Astarte. Um, mm -hmm. even as though separate. They're, yeah, I honor them as separate, even though they will literally like transform into each other when you call one or the other. Sometimes, I still honor them as separate because they're separate personalities in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I have to work with those two at some point in the future. I really do. But I've kind of taken a break from doing spiritual Pokemon for a while. I've kind of sort of, you know, uh, what's the word looking for? Um, De-theosize myself, maybe. That's not a real word. I'm trying to invent a word that means what I'm saying. I've, I've sort of turned away from being theistic for a minute, you know, not working with externalized spirits for a few months now because I've been trying to focus on my own will say uh, uh, direct energetic understanding rather than always invoking spirits for things. You know, I'm like, okay, you know, sooner or later, it's almost like schizophrenic, you know, am I talking to myself too much? You know, 
you got to take a break every now and then. You can burn out. Where were we going? <clears throat> no, I've lost my train of thought. That's all. <laughs> I do that because I talk. See, I have like OCD and ADHD a little bit where. Oh, I remember, I remember now. Okay, okay, I'll shut up. Go ahead. Go, 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 go. <laughs> um, so feeling burned out because you're trying to keep track of so many different spiritual relationships, I think is what you're saying. A little bit. And it's also right. maybe my skepticism uh, will sort of go, okay, why are you putting so much energy into things that you know are part of yourself? Why not just work with yourself, right? In in, in yes. that sense. Yeah. Same. That's um, part of what I'm saying. And I, I feel you, you know, I think that um, taking time and focusing on your own black flame and um, your, your God self, you know, is important in this mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And keeping that strong throughout the process of um, working with any spirit. So, you know, I have a theory that um, all of these gods were once men or women that basically, for lack of a better way of saying it, completed the great work, ascended, became ascended masters and were the kings and queens of whatever empires came before recorded history even and were remembered as divinity just like we remember the the the, the god kings of egypt right and uh so so they were carried forth their their consciousness so universal conscious can peer through any aperture of mind that it wants it can peer through me and you equally or separately at the same time but also these disembodied entities, these egregores, these ghosts, these, these, these memories, they're still alive in the collective consciousness of humanity. So when we think about them, we're literally sort of opening a doorway for that consciousness to shine through, like for, for that flavor of consciousness to be. So literally, they are living things. They're stories, but they're living stories just like we are, like we're living stories. And consciousness can focus on them at any point. So... I guess what I'm saying is, is that if, say, someone like me or you, if we complete the great work and we make enough of a memory of ourselves that people remember us for a long time, we could theoretically ascend to the same kind of, and when I say we, I mean our egos, could ascend to the same status, maybe a lower status or a higher or whatever, an equal kind of status to that divinity in the collective mind, right, in the collective memory of humanity. And sort of serve humanity for, for generations to come. So, for example, if you look at, I always say Zeus, because that's the one everybody thinks of. If you look at Zeus, you're really talking about Jupiter. You're talking about Marduk. You're talking about Bel, you know, Baal Haddad. You're talking, you go, you go through that current all the way back. You're also talking about Indra in India. You're talking about the same planet, the same energy, the same character, Thor. They're all basically the same archetype, the same character. And they all had to do the same kinds of things to become where they are in their in their their various pantheon you know they're not always the king of the gods but they're usually really important and if it, they almost always have to either as part of their becoming king of the gods they had to defeat a serpent or their father so so they either had to beat tiamat for marduk or they had to uh defeat cronus you know if they're zeus but they also had to deal with a giant sea serpent. They, so what that's symbolic of, to me, is the um, dissolution of the limited human ego. That is, you, you recognize your ego is, it's not bad, but you recognize that it is a limiting factor. You're not really this ego. When you transcend that, you can become capable of seeing and expanding your consciousness, literally becoming a living God. And then when, of course, you... You, you stop being alive, shall we say, you're alive. And, um, the memory of that person can potentially move on to become a king of a pantheon, maybe. What do you think of that potential? I don't have facts for it, but that's just my theory. What do you think of that theory? Um, I uh, would have to agree. And I think it's uh, accurate. And I, um... hold on, let me think. Take your time, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think in a way that these gods um, will create human souls and put themselves in human souls mm. to 
to have experiences at the same time. And I think that um, that's part of the process. And we, um, we are them in a way because history is like um, time is a cycle, like it's an eight, you know, figure eight. So really, we are honoring the ancestors, our ancestors, by honoring the gods. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're honoring ourselves and our progeny too at the same time. We're, exactly. So just like I said, you and I are actually the same conscious talking to each other. Like, like I see you as me, just the other side of me. And I still feel like there's a, a difference between us, but a part of us, I'm like, you know, I'm talking to myself right now. I'm talking to another incarnation of me. Like when you're talking about reincarnation, I don't see time as a linear thing. I think all time exists as one constant. And it's, it's our, our perception that's moving around, that figure eight, if you will. Our perception is what's moving through that, like a needle in a record. So right now, I'm just focused on this guy. But any time, I could be you and not even know it because ignorance is a major part of this. In order to be immortal, you have to forget that you're God. That's, that's my latest teaching to the world, is that you're God, but you've forgotten that fact. Like you're the God, the, the, the goddess of the gods. That's what you are. But you've forgotten it and have chosen consensually to dwell as a mortal in an embodied way for a while because why not it's exciting it's fun it's interesting and you know that's why it's a shame when people hate their lives and go through that dark night of the soul because it's it's all beautiful even that dark night of the soul is 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 a beautiful experience ultimately as much as it might suck when it happens yeah <laughs> and it's when when you get through it and you look back on it and you're so proud of what you accomplished and <clears throat> the fact that you survived it all and how you've grown because of it, it's um, it's worth getting through it and always remembering that <clears throat> your life is worth living, you know? Yeah. Life is worth living. I like that, yeah. It's, it's so not just, so, it's why you're here. Yeah, if, if you're so old and your life quality sucks, I get it, you know, it's probably time to hit the reset button. But. Yeah, I think everyone should have the right to uh, Sudoku, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think I think everyone should have that. Like, I'm definitely a fan of the the. Um, I should be a, I should be careful because YouTube is censorious lately. But, oh, you yeah. know, I'm definitely a fan of allowing people the ability to choose when they they want to be alive. And I'm definitely I'm definitely on board with that. Um, so long as it's, you know, something done in a respectful way. Really, that's that's what matters, right? So. Yeah, I agree. Like um, an old person that, like I said, doesn't have quality of life anymore. You know, mm -hmm. they want choose when they want to go that makes sense to me rather than suffering yeah. you know? right i think we i think i'm with alan watts on that too like i love the idea of you know we should have um not hospitals that maintain your life forever we should also have clinics and institutions where instead of spending hundred thousand dollars on some kind of like 10 percent chance cancer cure Maybe mm -hmm. we could take that money and spend that on a beautiful last month of life where you're like living it up in the Caribbean or whatever you want to do so that your your exit can be as wonderful as possible. And then you go out with as little pain as possible, you know, and, and just have that beautiful transition. Because I think most of the reason why people upon the death of the body, because I don't believe in death. I think death is an illusion. I think upon I, I believe that upon the expiration of the body, most people are too attached to this body. So when it stops being their their home of their attention, that that disconnect causes psychic trauma, pain, if you will. Mm -hmm. They're not ready. They, they they haven't so like they haven't tripped on their they haven't tripped balls hard enough with LSD to realize that they're that they're God. So when that happens, when they die, and they're confronted with this, I'm more than this body. In fact, I'm a lot more than this body. I'm everything. They're not ready to really properly process that consciously, you know, and, and it gives them a little pain because that transition's difficult. And I think the more, the more peaceful that transition, maybe the better it is, maybe. Kind of like when you go to sleep at night. When you go to sleep at night, your consciousness get, goes back into its full, I think, personally, into its full potential. Yeah. I think consciousness returns to its divine state, which is why your dreams, you can have superpowers. When you when you awaken again, you're literally focusing back down to this little tiny fragment of yourself and it's limited again. So when you die, if that transition smooth, it's just like going to sleep and you basically dream beautiful dreams and, and reincarnate again if you want. Um, whereas if it's traumatic, you're more inclined to go into some kind of nightmare, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. I believe, you know, 
everything you said there is accurate as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me a little bit. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but tell, I want to get more because you're going to be on my channel, and I want people to respect you. So, you've got published books. I meant to say this earlier. You've got published yeah. books. So, what have you got, and who who have you published them through, and how well are they doing? Do you do, like, you know, plug yourself a little bit for the people at home? Sure. <laughs> um, I have uh, four <laughs> books out, and the first three are pretty short, and um, they're not really that um, well done technically, you know because I was kind of learning as I was going and trying to figure out how to do it well. And um, so I have Enoch's Book of Sigils, which is a book about how to use uh, the sigils of the Watchers for doing divination. And then I did the same thing with um, Grimoire of the Nebiru, which is a book about um, using the sigils of the Egyptian gods and goddesses for divination and also words of power from them. And then I have the Book of Soul Retrieval, which is, um, like it says, about soul retrieval, but also it's kind of a, a first book to get if you're getting into the left-hand path and getting into doing magic. It's a good book to use because it teaches you the basics of doing evocation mm -hmm. and doing ritual. Um, and then my, my latest book is... Um, the Black Witch, which I published through Become a Living God. And that's, you know, the best of uh, my work, I think, so far. It's about, obviously, the, um, not obviously, but I tell my story about, you know, how I got into the left-hand path and how <clears throat> I, I kind of used that to heal myself. And I also, you know, get into the Kabbalah and the Klopoth and different uh, gates that have never been accessed um, also. Um, well, at least stuff. aren't talked about anyway, at the very least, right? Yeah, like like that's the way I see it. I think yeah. everything has been <clears throat> dealt with sooner or later, but Good people point. don't talk about them. They're still secret maybe, or, they, or there's a yeah. new way of looking at them that we don't think about. Okay, cool, so most of your stuff, where can they find that, especially the ball, I guess that's on, on blog.co forward slash something, yeah. right? Bog.co slash Enoch or something like that. <laughs> Just go to <laughs> God. I'm sure it's there somewhere. Really. People, and, people uh, often Bog. think I work for Bog because I have so much Bog interaction now, which is funny because when I first appeared on the scene, I was like, I will never be part of Bog because I just hate, I don't want to be a joiner. And, all. and then I just ended up becoming friends with everybody because why not, you know? And, and, and it's like, I'll never be part of Bog officially, but I'm friends with pretty much almost everybody in Bog because I've never had a bad experience with you guys. You guys have always been up you know upstand yeah i understand why people might uh not like bog because maybe they um present as having a lot of answers and uh there's people out there that have a lot of answers that aren't bog you know yeah but yeah. i think um uh, bog is a good company and a good publisher and they've always treated me well and they've always you know um been very fair so i can't say mm -hmm. a bad thing about them you know mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying is it's like I've never had a bad interaction with with EA or anybody else that that is still in bog. And yes, there's a few people that maybe I that used to be that I don't that I don't respect now for sure. Um, uh, people that I've worked with, in fact, that I will never talk to again. But, you know, it's it's definitely like uh, the way I see it, we're all trying to do the same thing, you know. People, people will look at EA and say, like, oh, he's, he's all about the money. He, yeah, I mean, of course he wants to eat, but he's got a very valid spiritual practice, you know, behind him. He's not just doing this for money, just like I sell stuff, but I try to make it as sincere as I can. And and I could just be some guy living in his mom's basement talking about this, but what is it that Crowley said about you'll know them by their accomplishments or so, I forget, something like that. You'll know when someone is a practitioner by what they've accomplished in their life through it, you know? And if someone is just a nerd in their mom's basement reading out of books and being sincere, that's really great. They're not useless, they're not bad. They're, I'm not trying to talk down to them, I'm not being an elitist about it, but I am saying that just because someone's successful at it or makes a career out of it, don't just look at them and be like, oh, well, there must not be valid because there's money involved. So long as, for my personal part of it, so long as I never pursue something spiritually just because there's a dollar sign on it, I'm mm -hmm. happy. You know, right. I'm good with it. If if I'm if the only reason I work with Lilith is because those books are selling, 
then I have sold myself to something that's not legit yeah. and I, and I won't do it. So, you know, that's kind of like the way I see it. That's, the, that's like the line in the sand for me, you know? Yeah. No, I really think uh, I a hundred percent agree. And I, I wouldn't write books if I had to write what other people wanted me to write. You know what I mean? I write them because I want to express the experiences that I've had and the, the power I've experienced with certain systems and spirits, you know, and mm -hmm. I want to share that with other people. Yeah. yeah. And there's not a lot of money in books by itself. You really got to promote just, them and, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just, I just, you know, I make enough money to get by, you know. Exactly. Same here. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't mind telling people what I make because it's not that much. It's yeah. it's like I basically make a little bit better than minimum wage where I live, like equivalent, selling books, doing services and everything else. It's not a it's I'm not living it up, guys. I'm really not. This is this is a work. This is work. You know, <laughs> right. It is. It's a passion. You know, it's not about the money. And yes, I want to advance and make more money in the future. And I'm working on that now and creating more um, books kind of building a um, curriculum in a way for people to follow if they follow my particular type of system or work that I do. And um, I'm just gonna expand on that as time goes by. That's the plan. I think we should all enroll in a class to learn how to teach people. Maybe if we did that, we could do it. We could maybe final, we could finally break that. Um, Cause there's so many books like mine do that. Mine are trying to teach beginners and all that stuff. But then we always feel like, well, how come we don't have it this way or that way? And I wonder, maybe we should all go like as a big club, we'll go and take a class on on how to teach people things, you know, like whatever class that teachers go to and learn how to be teachers and then start over writing. all. I bet you our books would all be really different. Yeah, right? you bring up a very good. <laughs> it's kind of yeah, a mess. Right? You know, it really is because you can get something from my books, you get something from your books, you get something from EA's books, JS's books, everybody, people, you know, Ball Cadman, all these different people have great stuff that it's too bad we can't like have somebody just like create a college and take all of this stuff like a Hogwarts and find the best of it and put it together. That'd be really cool. So yeah. make a curriculum out of it. Yeah. Definitely. So did you have any specific questions for me that we didn't get to or uh, anything like that? I wrote them down. Let me check real quick. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. <laughs> okay. Only one other thing that I want to get your opinion about, like when you're going through like a hardcore initiation with a particular pantheon or path working, or even like doing possession for 90 days or whatever, do you think it's a good idea to ask a spirit for a break during that? if you feel like, you know, it's compromising your health and you feel like you're mentally maybe getting pushed over the edge. And if you did, like, how would you approach it? So I've got a couple layers to this answer. I mean, obviously everybody's a little different. So that's always, almost always a, a caveat to any advice I give. Everybody's a little different. Me personally, being a little OCD and ADD, which means I can focus like a needle when it's something I'm into to the point of, of like, you know, I might be on the spectrum, like that's how obsessed I can get. But then I can be very ADD and easily distracted. This is one reason why I over talk people so much because when you're talking, I get an idea and I, I, if I, if I don't say it, I'm going to forget it. And then my anxiety is like, why didn't you say it? And I'm like, fuck, I should have brought it up. So I tend to over talk people in the same way when I do things with spirits, I don't do 90 days because I know that I'm going to burn out on that spirit within a few days. Like it's only going to take me a week or two and I'm going to be like, fuck this thing. I, I'm so tired of working with this one spirit. I don't care anymore. I'm also an autodidact, which means I'm self-taught for almost everything that I do. I don't like having overbearing teachers too much. I like having people I can go to for advice, like mentors rather than teachers. I like people that I can hit when I need it, not, not necessarily all the time. So when I do a, an initiation with a system, what that really means to me is I will, first I have to be called, just like you said. I agree completely when you talked about Lilith and being called by a spirit in some way. You have to feel a connection first. And Lilith in particular, you don't go chasing Lilith. Lilith comes to you has been my finding ever since the beginning. You don't, you can't make Lilith come to you. You've got to ask Lilith to come to, you know, you can ask, but you don't, Lilith, you better come, right? You got to be like, I'm inviting you, but it's up to you. Right. And 
when Lilith comes, you don't have much to say about it. Lilith will just show up, and you had better you better respect that call. I love her for it. At first, I was scared, and then I was like, "So you're basically my spiritual mother in a way, right?" You know, she's like, "Absolutely," and 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 that mother is more like a crocodile than like a loving a loving uh, mother bird or something. She's very much like a, you know, she'll protect the eggs, and then you, you're getting strengthened by hardship. That's what's happening. Like you're you're going to be cold blooded too in a way. But she's still loving. Anyway, too much about love. My point is, is that every one of these, these initiations I've done have been more of a gradual learning and leaning into it. And then next thing I know, I'm just talking to a spirit either because of a ritual or I'm just going for a walk in the woods and I'm just like, whoa. And I just have a, a connection and I talk to them and they just come to me when it's time. Only uh, a handful of the spirits that I've effectively worked with did I seek out first. In other words, I said, I really want to work with that spirit. I'm going to do a ritual for it and make it happen. Most of the time it was, I there was a mutual calling going on. Whereas, so to give you an example with um, one I haven't done formal ritual with would be the Oni from Japan. The, the, the demons like Sh uh, uh, um, Shuten Doji and Ibaraki Doji and all of those demonic entities from Japan. Or, or the um, uh, the Tengu and the various entities from Japan. I've wanted to work with them, but I just don't do ritual for it. But I felt this urge to research, to get to know them. I'll visualize them. I'll sometimes talk to what I think are them in my environment. And, and that's as far as it's gone. I haven't done any full rituals or initiations. So to me, that's all part of the initiatory process. You have to remember the initiation means you're kind of, you, you're either you know, cutting the veil, seeing through the veil, merging through the veil, whatever you're doing, you're, you're initiating yourself into the idea of it. But the final, the, to be caught, to go from, so you're an initiate, you're an adept, and then you're a master. When you're right. an initiate, you're just getting to know this stuff. And to me, there's no wrong way to do that. Um, now, let's say you are doing a longer path working with the spirit. I did 30 days with Azazel. That was as long as I was willing to do with the spirit. Um, and Azazel and I don't, We'll say we don't get along as well as some other spirits do. Uh, I'm not saying we're enemies, but but right. uh, you know Azazel and I, we kind of, you know, when we talk, it's beautiful. But there's a lot of contention that happens. I I will say the wrong thing too much to him for some reason. I think because I will try to do sort of works based things with him. In other words, uh, like the second time I called on him. I tried to get him to give me a, an audible sign like I like to do sometimes for the, oh. just to confirm for myself that there's a presence, not just my own feeling, right? And that pissed him off. And he completely, I felt him leave the room, the whole thing ended, and I'm like, oops. Yeah. You know, like that kind of annoyed him. Because And then he came back, yeah. he's like, you felt me, you felt the shivers go down your spine, you're hearing me in your head, what more do you need? And, I, and I'm like, you're right, you're completely right. And, and so we don't always... You know, he's a harder teacher than most is what I'm getting at. And uh, yeah. I'm not saying that he doesn't teach me or work with me. It's just I tend to <clears throat> you're over here and we'll talk when you want type of thing. So mm -hmm. um, he's not like a part of my immediate pantheon. He's sort of an external entity I work with. So anyway, so that was the longest period I ever went with the spirit uh, consistently. In fact, I did a Zazel exclusively for a month. So I wasn't even working. I had to put my familiar away. I had to, like, he, he demanded it was just him, nothing else. And I was like, so you only want me to talk to you? And he's like, yes, you can't work with your familiars, none of your other spirits, Lucifer, nothing. It's just me and you. And I'm like, okay, if that's what you demand, then that's what we're going to do. And that was rough. By the end of it, I, I was looking forward to bringing back my other stuff. We'll put it that way. Um, and I completed it. You know, I did do it. So more specifically to your question about taking breaks, though, you are always the you're always in charge of the process. If you're not vibing with the spirit. I do believe that you have to keep your commitments. So if you say, you know, like magic with a spirit either won't work or will backfire if you don't keep your commitment. If you tell a spirit, I'm going to do this and you don't, chances are very good, especially if it's a real harsh Saturnian kind of spirit or something like that, they're going to extract a toll of some kind if you don't keep your end of the bargain. If you promise Azazel 30 days with no other contact and you sneak a, 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 a ritual with another spirit, you're probably going to get something negative happen, probably. I'm not saying curse, but you're probably going to have a, a bad time. So 
it really goes, it really depends on what your commitment is. If you tell a spirit, I'm going to work with you for these 90 days and not stop every day, I'm going to be possessed by you and do ritual by you every day, then you're probably going to better off do that. Probably better off to do that than to not do it. And if you end up burning out on it, use that as an experience. Like just be like, okay, don't commit to 90 days next time. Maybe just make it a week. Um, what I prefer to do is, so I've got certain spirits that I work with more than others. So Lucifer would be probably over my lifetime, the longest, biggest, although I didn't always know it was Lucifer. We'll put it that way. The next would be the shadow people, probably equally, uh, specifically Ronzael and Legion from, from that current. Then would probably be the crow spirit, which I found out if I was to have a spirit animal, if I was going to go on that shamanic journey, the crow or the raven would be my would be my right. spiritual archetype. And so any kind of crow spirit, usually uh, President Malfoss from the Goetia or just the crow or raven, as I call it, entity, egregore, whatever. That's right. what I like to. So I always work with those. I call myself a crow witch as a kind of side name, you know, like that's I don't use it very often, but I will use it. Um, I see myself as the crow witch, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, and you can see, like, I even have things. I love, you know, imagery of crows and, and birds right. and things like that. So it's a very strong current for me. Uh, other than that, though, it's kind of up in the air. I've worked a lot with King Paimon, King Baal, Balaam, all the different Goetic kings I've worked with, either a lot or enough. Um, and And moving forward, I'm interested in the Greek pantheon a little bit more and Egyptian pantheon a little bit more. I want to work more with those pantheons directly. So my answer is not really an answer. It's a, it depends. It's up to you. Yeah. Take time off if you need it, because the worst thing in my experience, especially if you're like me with ADD, OCD, very minor, I'm not like sick or anything, but, but you know, I have it. If you burn out on things like I do, and if you're self-taught, you're going to feel a need to, take breaks. You just will, you know, uh, like I've done since sometime last year, I kind of, to put it bluntly, I, I, I feel like I can't talk to a lot of the spirits that I used to talk to. Like they've kind of said, you need a break from all of us and all of this. And I put a wall there too. Like, it's like King Paimon. I've tried to reach out to several times and I've gotten this message. Like I'm here, but you need to be with you right now. Like we're, we're, we're not supposed to talk right now. You're supposed to be work on yourself don't feel like you got to talk to me when you're ready. I'll be there, you know, and right. to the point where I'm like, maybe I'm not supposed to work with King Paimon as King Paimon anymore. Maybe I'm supposed to find his, his more archetypal source, you know, and work with that in myself. I don't know. So I've kind of shut all of that down and have focused, I've refocused back on my own sense of non-dual enlightenment again, because I think I lost sight of that for a minute while De delving so deep into the left hand black magic angle that I kind of for a minute got a little egoistic for a minute, like a little too uh, <laughs> distracted by the theistic side. I know exactly what you mean. I, I did the same thing where I forgot my own black flame and my own oneness. And um, it's a, I, I think it's very important, like I said before, to make time for it and keep it keep up with it and remember that you're the operator you're the center of your rituals and you know any entity you're the baphomet for lack of it for a really cool symbol you're the baphomet yes yes right. perfect um i guess um i would challenge you a little bit with your answer and say that what if um the particular spirit that you're working with is testing you to mm -hmm. see if you will speak up and say hey enough enough you know, that's a good point i like that because mm -hmm. if they they might be doing that and they might be like kicking your ass and making you get up at three in the morning to do ritual sure. every day and then you're exhausted and then um but they're looking for that point that you're going to break and say you know i can't i won't do it anymore i want to take a break mm -hmm. they're looking see where your breaking point is where, where your balls. breaking point and also where your balls are to put it in a more blunt way like yeah. when do you when do you take your balls out of your person and, <laughs> and 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 male or female you know what i mean when do you stand up for yourself because i i think that's one of the reasons i have the success i have is because i don't need that lesson uh i've always been ballsy when i work not in a in a rude way but in a i see myself as as an equal to them always they might know things i don't know and be capable of things i'm not 
but we're all the same divinity. So I'm like, I'm not taking orders from you. You're not going to push me around. I don't need some book of exorcisms. Go ahead and give me your best shot. I'm not scared of you. And, but I don't treat them rudely. I go to them, thank you for coming. I, I Like a king to a king. I treat them like royalty, but I expect to be treated pretty much equally as that, you know? And so I've, I've never had an issue where a spirit's tried to boss me around. And if they have, I'm like, you get over there then. I don't need you. Um, you know, because there are spirits that will try that. And, and yeah. that might be a test. That might be a test, yes. But I don't usually see it from higher spirits. That's usually from the little flotsam in the environment that will try to control you. Like you'll be walking through the woods and you'll get a jump scare. Like something will happen. You'll be, oh, what was that? Right. Get behind me. You're, you're nothing. You're just a little entity in the woods. I'm not worried about you. You know, uh, so there's that. But then maybe sometimes, you know, my flaw, if I had to say it was a flaw, and I don't believe in flaws, but the things that I think I need to learn is sometimes that more disciplined approach of you're not going to catch me doing ritual every day. I'm just never going to do that. Right. But there's something to be said for doing it. Like, I don't disparage anybody who does. But me, it's like I'm good once a week or so. Like, you know, I'm not I don't need to do this daily at all. Yep. You know. So I do maybe I could use more discipline. <laughs> What's that? I have too much discipline. I do ritual at least twice a day. Oof. Yeah, that's a lot, man. That's a lot. A lot yeah. but... but then again, it depends on what your definition of discipline is. So I don't need to do ritual to do a lot of the things that I do. So yep. uh, I can if I'm writing, there's a good chance I'm channeling. There's a, there's a, I mean, I will go off into what some would call a daydream. I go off into like an astral dream. I might be communing with a spirit and and writing what I'm hearing, kind of. I'll be describing a scene as it's happening in my head and working from there. And I have to tell you, most of my stuff is written once and then I maybe edit it and that's it. I don't do a lot to it to, to purify it, if, if you will. This latest yep. book is a little different. But so I guess what I'm getting at is I don't need this. This is this is props. This is tools. This is fun. But I can have the same experience that that remember, I've been doing this since I was 13 channeling in, in mediumship. I've been doing this for a long time. To me, channeling a spirit, all it takes is a connection and I can just and just go right into it. Yep. It's very easy for me. So I don't need all of this. I can just go out and go for a walk with my staff or, or naked, whatever. And if the mood hits me, if the music that I'm listening to is just right, if the trees blow the right way, whatever it takes, and I'm, I suddenly feel like there's a presence, I'm going to talk to it. That's all it takes. And then yeah. that's the magic. That's the ritual for me. I don't need the other stuff. So I guess I'll say I don't do the practice of ritual every day, but I definitely do magic every day. That's not a question. Right. That makes sense to me. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all the questions I had, man. All right, man. It's so I definitely had fun talking to you. I mean, you're a laid back guy. You know, I think, you yeah. know, you're, you're like, I'm on camera. What are we going to talk about? But I think you, I think we did good and I think we had fun. And I'd like to have you on my Thursday night stream at some point if you're up for it. Uh, you know, that might be fun to have you meet everybody like Flesh Priest and everybody else have a have a, a, a spirit that you can get in on the jokes we get in on Thursday nights, if you will. Uh, yeah, you know, awesome. we're kind of fast and loose on Thursdays. There's a lot of there's yeah. a lot of uh, <laughs> comedy watch, going. I haven't on. watched any of them. I don't think I have to watch a couple and see what you guys are like. We're we're pretty crazy. EA comes on. He'll be talking about his escapades and sexcapades, and we'll talk well, all all kinds of stuff, man. It's it's an open. So long as you don't get my channel banned, it's like say what you want, man. Just 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 be open and have fun. And I'm uh, pretty mild. <laughs> like I don't I don't do anything too crazy, anyways. You're not wild and crazy. You're not one of them. No, it's fine. But that's fine. Sometimes we need that balance. We need that that. Sometimes the straight man is very important to the to the comedy act. I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah. So, all right, man. So I'll leave it up to you. So I'm going to stop recording right about now, but I want to thank you. And once again, people who want to find you on my channel, uh, how can they find you? Um, um, obviously, uh, YouTube, you know, Petroselli. And um, I have a, a Facebook that I use as a kind of a hub to post videos and uh, information. And that is Enoch Sigil Creator and Card Reader. And you can find my books on Amazon.com and becomealivinggod.com. Awesome, awesome. And if people are looking for me, you can probably just Google D.H. Thorne. I'm all over Facebook. I'm on YouTube under D.H. Thorne. I have books on Amazon, Become the Maelstrom, Shadow Namicon, which is probably the one a lot of people recognize more because it's very unique. It's about the shadow people. I have a book that is about vampirism, mostly through a, a Lilith uh, uh 
initiation, you know, that version of vampirism. So using Lilith and her history in antiquity as being a vampiric entity as the initiator. So that's a very powerful book for some people. Um, so if you guys want to check that out, that's all on Amazon. If you look up my name or you can go to my channel and the links are all in my in my channel. So uh, if you're not already there, I guess, you know, <laughs> so. All right. All right, brother. I appreciate